Um, but it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Anita Azali. Uh, Anita is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology, and her major focus is in inflammatory bowel disease, and we'll be hearing about that in a second. But as a matter of uh, background, um, Anita received her undergraduate degree uh, from Washington State University in genetics and cell biology, and then we were able to recruit her to University of Washington, where she received her medical degree, a master's in public health, and she completed her medicine internal residency, or internal medicine residency, as well as her GI fellowship. And she also completed an advanced fellowship in management and inflammatory bowel disease uh, during this process. So with that great training, we were able to recruit her uh, to University of Washington in 2012, and this last year, able to appoint her as assistant professor of medicine. Her research and clinical interests, specifically in IBD, also span the very difficult transition from pediatrics to adult. And you may know of these uh, uh, our recent efforts to really examine how do you transition kids to adults in their care. And she's a co-director of the transition clinic between Seattle Children's Hospital and the University of Washington. She is also the associate medical, uh, excuse me, the associate medical director for the GI clinic at Harborview Medical Center and the director of IBD for Harborview Medical Center. Um, she has uh, numerous awards, and I would say in particular, a real prominent role in the national organization of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation in America, the CCSA, and has been recently awarded uh, the contract to provide the uh, online or web-based training for IBD for the West Coast for the CCSA, which is quite a feat to submit at her state of training. She has numerous grants, including an NIDD, uh, NIDDK and I grant, a picture run to the CCFA to look at uh, novel therapy, including methotrexate for the management of ulcerative colitis, and a whole bunch of clinical trials. If you ha have patients with IBD, uh, most likely you sent patients to her to get access to some of the very new novel biological therapies. There's numerous publications at very high impact journals, including gastroenterology, hepatology, and the clinical uh, American Journal of Gastroenterology. She's been an invited speaker uh, both nationally and internationally. And, and today, uh, she's going to provide a very unique perspective on personalized medicine for the uh, treatment of IBD. So, Anita, thanks so much for being to talk with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, and I'm very happy to be here this morning with you all today. So, thank you for the invitation to participate in your ground rounds. So the title of my talk is Updates and Challenges in the Management of Inflammatory Bowel Disease. One second, get this. So here are my disclosures. So I'd first like to start with a patient case. So this is a gentleman, 22 years old. He's had eight, an eight month history of bloody stools, diarrhea up to about five times a day, abdomen pain, weight loss, and a recent diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. His past medical history is otherwise unremarkable. His medication is primarily the iron supplementation given his iron deficiency anemia. Family history, father with coronary artery disease, but no family history otherwise that's remarkable. He's been a smoker since the age of 17. And laboratory studies, as you can see here, they're quite rather uh, uh, nonspecific. It could incorporate a number of different diagnoses here. A slight elevation in white blood count, certainly an elevation in inflammatory markers, specifically CRP and ESR, and a slightly lower albumin of 3.3. <laughs> so obviously this talk is on inflammatory bowel disease, so we're all thinking IBD. But I think what's important to remember, and the reason I'm presenting this case specifically, is that we need to remember that our clinical symptoms for IBD are not specific for IBD, meaning that we need to always have a good differential diagnosis of other things that may potentially be a source or cause for the symptoms of our patients. Specifically, in our differential diagnosis, we need to consider infection. And certainly, even in, in uh, an infectious source, we can actually see inflammation, for example, when we perform a colonoscopy, and that could actually be a source related to an infectious etiology rather than inflammatory bowel disease. For example, ileocolonic involvement, patient can present with bloody diarrhea, and an infectious cause or source for that, we should include Campylobacter, Salmonella, E. coli, Shigella. Terminal ileum, a patient can present with right lower quadrant pain, 
And for that, we have to put in our differential. Of course, we'll put IBD, but appendicitis and even Yersinia. And then what about proctitis and rectal pain, presenting with rectal pain? Again, in our differential diagnosis, we need to also consider chlamydia in, in the potential patient. And then other differentials include ischemia, radiation, and also certain medications, drug-related, such as the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, where we could actually see inflammation or inflammatory changes in the gut when we scope, but it would be related to drug injury and not necessarily inflammatory bowel disease. So what is inflammatory bowel disease? Well, it's actually characterized by a chronic inflammation of the gut. But really, it's really a dysregulation of the immune system. And that's what's important to remember. Under IBD, we have Crohn's disease, which involves any part of the gastrointestinal tract. And we have ulcerative colitis. And with ulcerative colitis, the disease is limited to the colon only. For Crohn's disease, the involvement is usually primarily presents in either the terminal ileum or near the, primarily on the right side of the colon and the very distal part of the ileum. So again, the terminal ileum, ileocolonic. Upper gastrointestinal involvement is actually quite rare if the, the disease is diagnosed later onset. So what I mean by that is upper gastro involvement is usually more common in, my, in our pediatric population where the diagnosis was made at an early on, uh, age. IBD is characterized by periods of remission and relapse. Sometimes they feel well. Sometimes they definitely don't feel well. And the symptoms are quite variable. And it's based on where is the disease and how bad is the disease. And so the, there's no classic symptoms. And again, I want to emphasize that because Again, based on location and severity of the disease, that's the type of symptom the patient may have. And it's also really important to remember that IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, is not IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. Sometimes my patients say, well, my employer just doesn't understand why my IBD is so bad because hers isn't that bad. And I always ask them, can you clarify with them potentially, are we talking about IBD or are we talking about IBS? Now, again, the primary source or cause is an inappropriate immune response. And we think that there are certain factors that actually trigger the actual presentation of inflammatory bowel disease. One of those factors is a, is a genetic component. Second factor is an environmental component. And then lastly, there's the factor of the normal gut constituents, so the normal microbia, antigens. So we all know what our immune system does, right? You fall, you get a cut on your knee, what happens? Well, our immune system naturally turns on to try to fight any potential infection that's occurring in our body. So in this case, in this picture, at the site of the knee. After the immune system has been able to successfully eradicate the infection, our immune system knows how to turn off. Now the problem in inflammatory bowel disease is that this on-off switch is actually broken or dysregulated. And so inflammation is a key aspect of inflammatory bowel disease. I don't expect you to know all of these pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines, but as you can see here, that with chronic inflammation, there's a dominance of the pro-inflammatory cytokines and proteins. And with that dominance, that's why there, the chronic inflammation occurs, because there's ongoing active inflammation that over time now results in chronic inflammation. Now, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis is the same process as other, uh, what we can call autoimmune conditions, where in other processes such as rheumatoid arthritis, there's a dysregulation of the immune system gut specific. With multiple sclerosis, we can see a similar disease type of presentation. With certain types of lung involvement or asthma, we can see it and then lastly, with psoriasis, same process, but just different sites of disease. So let's talk about some of the factors. So we'll start with the genetic factor. Now, is IBD a genetic disorder? Yes and no. Okay, so there's approximately 10% association with patients who also have a positive family history. But 10% is not very high. 2 to 10% risk for IBD in a patient if a first degree relative is affected by it as well. And even among identical twins, 
you can see that inheritance of the disease is actually 40 to 60 percent, not 100 percent, among identical twins. So the IBD, or inflammatory bowel diseases, I'd like to put here, is actually quite a complex genetic disorder. We've discovered numerous different genes, but we know that all of these genes are potentially associated with inflammatory bowel disease, but we have not found a gene that's causal, meaning if you test positive or lack the gene or don't have the gene, then you would have inflammatory bowel disease. So we're not quite sure yet what all these genetic associations or genes specifically that have been identified actually mean in inflammatory bowel disease. Let's talk about the environment. Well, to understand the environment, we first have to understand what makes us, what makes us more. Is it us as human cells or is it our intestinal bacteria? And in fact, we have more intestinal bacteria, bacteria 100 trillion worth of it than actual human cells that makes up our composition. And this bacteria, the intestinal bacteria that we're referring to, is actually our microbiome, right? So it refers to the entire microbial gut composition. The question, and of interest recently, is what is the role of our microbiome, of our microbiota, in, in good health? And conversely, what is the role of the microbiota in bad health, specifically, for example, inflammatory bowel disease? We know that an unhealthy microbiome, or dysbiosis, if we could use that term, we know that it results in certain diseases and or has been re uh, reported to be associated with certain diseases, to the point that now of, of a lot of interest, particularly in IBD, is the role of fecal transplant or fecal microbiota transplantation in patients who are affected with inflammatory bowel disease to see if potentially we could restore their gut composition. So here's a proposed model of how this works. As you can see here, there's the healthy microbiome, composed of, again, the 100 trillion bacteria, plus, uh, to the normal uh, genetic makeup. Does it result in health, unhealthy or healthy? And you can see it's healthy. Second uh, row, B, is that dysbiosis. C is also dysbiosis. So it could either be an increase in pro-inflammatory bacteria or decrease in the anti-inflammatory bacteria, it interacts with our genetic composition, and then you can see result of disease. Now the problem here is that this is a proposed mechanism of how we think our microbiota is associated with the disease of inflammatory bowel. But we haven't quite have had good evidence, or hard evidence, or good understanding of what makes a healthy microbiome and what makes an unhealthy microbiome. With that said, we do know that there are potential environmental triggers that are associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And these particular triggers we have found either has a direct or an indirect effect to the microbiome. For example, an acute infection, steroid, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, smoking, we've absolutely seen that association, stress-induced, diet, antibiotics, each of these are potential triggers. Again, it's more of a two-hit model. Someone who already has a dysregulated immune system gets some form of environmental factor or trigger that ultimately results in disease presentation. And this has been studied in certain examples. For example, in children, the effect of antibiotics was studied. And based on the number of courses of antibiotics received for the child, their risk for inflammatory bowel disease actually increased over time. So again, suggesting that exposure potentially to antibiotics in this situation affects the microbiota and over time results in disease of inflammatory bowel. And what about on a global level? Well, in the past, we prim primarily considered inflammatory bowel disease, whether Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, as a Northern American, Northern European disease. But as you can see here, that over time, the, the prevalence as well as the incidence of IBD has actually increased. And not only has it increased, but it's increased in areas and regions of the world that we initially didn't even think that there would be much of inflammatory bowel diseases. So as you can see here, 
ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, again, still higher prevalence and incidence in Europe and Northern America. But in parts of the world, such as Asia and the Middle East, that trend is also increasing. Now, to date, the majority of our data has been primarily from Canadian and European populations, as well as uh, North American and US specific, but it's been primarily and predominantly in a Caucasian population. And so one of my personal interests in research is to study the prevalence and the trend and incidence of inflammatory bowel disease among other races and ethnic groups. And what we've actually been able to find is that there truly is an increase in inflammatory bowel disease, be it Crohn's disease or be it ulcerative colitis, among these different ethnic groups. And not only has there been an increase in disease diagnoses, but also the phenotype is quite variable based on the ethnic variation. Now, does this suggest possible disparities? Disparities in our treatment, for example, or access to care? And these are things that we're investigating further. So in the United States, 1.5 million Americans are affected with inflammatory bowel disease. Probably one, at least one or two people in this room have inflammatory bowel disease. Men and women are affected equally. And it has quite a bimodal distribution. And so we say 20 to 30, but really put that closer to 15 and even 10 now, based on, again, these changes that we're having in exposure and in our environment. And then beyond the age of 60, we also see a disease presentation, uh, both for Crohn's disease as well as ulcerative colitis. And again, as mentioned, we're seeing a rise in the disease among different races and ethnic groups. Specifically working at Harborview Medical Center, we have a great cohort to be able to evaluate this trend. So endoscopy. How do we differentiate ulcerative colitis from Crohn's disease? Well, as you can see from the bottom picture, ulcerative colitis is a contiguous inflammation of the colon. It starts in the rectum and slowly advances into the left side of the colon and ultimately potentially pancolonic. The disease is what we call very superficial. So we see erythema and granularity and edema in the lining of the, muc the, the mucosa of the colon. Whereas in contrast, Crohn's disease is a full thickness inflammation. It's patchy, but don't let the patchiness fool you because the amount of disease that occurs through all the layers of the mucosa can result in strictures, fistulas, abscesses. Now there's a few things I put here to really make sure you understand. Granulomas, non-casein granulomas, seen only about five to 15% of the time on biopsies. Far too often I get a report saying, uh, by, by a provider a description of it, say this is likely ulcerative colitis because no granulomas were seen on biopsies. Don't let that fool you. We, again, we only see granulomas on biopsies, endoscopic biopsies, at best 15% of the time. In rectal sparing, not necessarily the case all the time, but certainly seen more commonly in Crohn's disease. So endoscopy still is the gold standard for diagnosing inflammatory bowel disease, but primarily for the, for the terminal ileum and the colon. Anything higher upstream is considered the silver standard. And so we would consider a, a cross-sectional imaging and specifically interrography, whether it's an MRI or a CAT scan. We prefer an MRI because of the lack of radiation exposure associated with this. And we know in general our patients their lifetime exposure to radiation requiring multiple CTs potentially is extremely high. And so we try to reduce that. And that's why I typically always request an MRI over a CAT scan. And as I described, our biopsies are not pathognomonic. Not only do we not always see the granulomas, but what we see described on histopathology is quite, I mean, it could be anything, right? So nonspecific, but there are some things where we look at that and we say, hmm, why is there crypt architectural distortions? That makes us think. Why is there lamin appropriate inflammation or an increased basal or plasma cells? So there are some pathology findings that may be suggestive for the disease, but nothing that's happened mnemonic. So here are some pictures. On your far left there, you can see the normal villi, the terminal ileum, very healthy. It's my favorite part of the gastrointestinal tract. It looks very nice and healthy, a little furry there. And then what you can see in our colon, the pale pink mucosa, 
what I call a normal vascular pattern. You can see these little vascula, the halstra. Everything is normal. Take my word for it. This is not normal. Take my word for it. Right? So here you have the normal in the top uh, left, but then there's that mild disease. And as you can see here, you actually see a little bit of that loss of vascular pattern. Then you have more moderate, where it's edematous. And then you have severe, where it's completely ulcerated, edematous, no vascular pattern, and, and that's considered severe disease. And what about Crohn's disease? What's that spectrum? Well, it's a huge spectrum, so it's hard for me to put all the pictures of what we would see. But here are some examples of what we would see endoscopically. That far upper left is, are the aqueous ulcers that we can see endoscopically. Then you have these punched out lesions in the, the top right, that cookie cutter ulcer that we see where it just looks like it's just, you could just identify it from way far beyond. Then you have these linear or serpiginous ulcers, and you also have such severe ulceration and nodularity and cobble stoning, that might be a word some of you are familiar with, where, where it ultimately results in narrowing of the lumen. Clinical features for IBD is so actually quite variable. Again, it depends on disease site and severity. I have some patients who say, well, how can I have Crohn's disease? I don't have diarrhea. Again, it's based on where their disease is located for the disease presentation. Common physical exam findings could be anything, again, based on their disease. There are some ex extra intestinal manifestations of the disease, pyoderma gangrenosum, erythema nodosum, uveitis, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, joint arthropathy, oral ulcers. But again, some patients can have it, and some patients may never have an extra intestinal manifestation. As far as common laboratory radiographic findings, as you can see, I, uh, again, nonspecific, and I wanted to highlight ESR and CRP. As you all may know already, not everyone mounts a CRP response. What do I mean by that? A patient with inflammatory bowel disease can have severe disease, but a normal CRP. So sometimes my patients who are very ill have severe disease endoscopically, radiographic, et cetera, presents to the emergency department, and then I get a phone call saying, well, their CRP is normal, so I think they're okay. Right? So be cautious with the CRP ESR, because 15 to 20 percent of the general health normal population does not mount a CRP response. And what about the impact on different levels, whether it's a medical impact, work disability impact, as you can see here, within three years, half of our patients get hospitalized at least one time for management of their disease. The emotional impact is huge. Recently, there was a study stating that Crohn's disease is on the same level with CHS and COPD as the top three diseases for the leading cause of anxiety and depression. Huge quality of life impact. So back to our patient. So as you recall, 22 years old, he's had a year-long history of bloody diarrhea, pain, weight loss, anemia, <clears throat> and high inflammatory markers. He was scoped and found to have severe pancolitis from rectum to the cecum with a normal terminal ileum that was evaluated. Pathology, as you can see, very nonspecific. Diagnosed with ulcerative pancolitis and treated with steroids and mesalamine product of 5 amino solicitates. Now, I won't specifically talk about each of these classes of therapies, but rather introduce to you treatment strategies and what we use in order to find what's the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Introducing this concept of personalized medicine in inflammatory bowel disease. So some of you may have already heard these different approaches that have previously been used, whether it's the step-up strategy or the top-down strategy. The step-up strategy is more of a sequential standard approach where the patient initially may require a course of prednisone. The patient, uh, the patient then receives mesalamine products or 5-amino salicylates. If their disease advances or progresses, then we step up to the immune modulators, such as azathioprine or 6-mercaptopurine, or another immune modulator called methotrexate, 
if the disease becomes more severe, then we consider surgery and even maybe a biologic. Notice that we put those in the same category, surgery and biologics. The top-down approach is different. It says, no, we start early, and we start with early appropriate therapy. We start with our biologics early on, and in addition, potentially add a, a, a concomitant agent, an immune modulator. And as you can see, surgery becomes at the very bottom for, for and when the disease progresses and surgery is needed to treat a complication of the disease, but not to treat the disease. Now, both of these strategies have pros and cons and potential risks, as you can see. There's a high risk of disease progression, potentially, in some patients. So the step-up strategy may potentially postpone adequate therapy in a patient who has or is at risk of having aggressive disease. And this can result in complications, progression of disease and morbidity. The top-down approach can also potentially be risky. What if the patient has a low risk for disease progression? And now we may be potentially over-treating and exposing our patients not only to costs, but further immune suppression and other side effects or toxicities. So which strategy? Well, we know one size doesn't fit all. And this is where the concept of personalized medicine needs to start being applicable in inflammatory bowel disease. Because we know that neither taking the step up or the top down approach will work for every single patient. So what approach do we take and what factors do we base this on? Well, we actually have actual prognostic factors that helps us determine and helps us potentially predict who's at highest risk for disease progression. You can see here male, males age less than 40 based on disease location, particularly having extensive small bowel disease, perianal disease, fistulas, or requiring steroids at the initial time of diagnosis or at first time of flare, have all been factors that have been identified with a higher risk for disease progression, whether it's disabling or non-disabling. You can see there as categorized. There have been some independent risk factors, and specifically age, perianal lesions, and requiring steroids in this study that were identified to be the highest risk for, and, and predictive for a disable, disabling disease course. I will go back to this slide one more time and say smoking, regardless, high risk for disease progression in Crohn's disease. And so again, here, having more factors, the ones that we identified on the prior slide, places you at a higher risk for disease progression. So how did we or still do we treat inflammatory bowel disease? Well, medicines, the medicines that we give and prescribe for management of the disease, the purpose is to basically try to block the inflammation. But a few things. First of all, most of our therapies to date have been primarily borrowed or used after our smart rheumatology colleagues came up with a drug and then we borrowed it and applied it in inflammatory bowel disease. That has changed recently. But still, over the past 50 years or so, there still is very little data that we have, or really much understanding that we have on why these therapies work. But then more importantly, we have been unable to demonstrate with these therapies, whether it's the mesalamines, whether it's the, the prednisone, the steroids, whether it's your thiopurines or methotrexate, it has not altered the natural progression of the disease. And how will we or have we now started treating the disease? Well, now we have therapies that are target-specific, for example, to proteins such as TNF, tumor necrosis factor. The goal is to be target-specific potentially for genetic defects, microbial imbalances. Ultimately, we want to target what is responsible for the disease process. So in 1998 was the time when life changed for our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. This is when our first anti-TNF monoclonal antibody was FDA approved for Crohn's disease. And you can see that over time, further additional therapies were approved, either for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis or both. And these therapies have absolutely revolutionized the treatment and management of our patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Why do we use them? Because we know it's effective. We know studies over and over again have demonstrated that it has reduced hospitalizations, 
It has reduced surgery, which I'll uh, share with you the data on. It has reduced the need or requirement of steroids, and we are all very familiar with both long-term and short-term effects of use of prednisone and other corticosteroids. It has found to be the best in improving the quality of life, and again, it has actually been found to change the natural course history of the disease. Limitations, costs, they're expensive therapies, and also misinformation either by the patient or the provider as far as, am I really that sick? Do I really need that therapy? Is oftentimes asked. So here are some landmark studies that I don't expect you to know all the details, but when we say sonic, we hear that a lot. So the sonic trial, it was a, ther it was a large trial to demonstrate if and what our therapies are, and based on these, what is the most efficacious. And so, as you can see here, the red column is your azathioprine, which is your thiopurine. It was compared to infliximab, and that was compared to infliximab and azathioprine. Clearly, you can see here that the middle one, the yellow, was better than the red. So infliximab, our biologics, our anti-TNF, worked better than our azathioprine in achieving steroid-free clinical remission at week 50 for the patients. But what this landmark study also was able to demonstrate is that combination therapy, a combination of a biologic agent and an immune modulator is better than either alone. So this is the landmark trial called SONIC for Crohn's disease. And recently, a few years ago, SUCCESS came out. SUCCESS was the second landmark trial for ulcerative colitis demonstrating a very similar presentation. Thiopurine alone, infliximab alone, infliximab and thiopurine was able to achieve the best response, steroid-free remission, and mucosal healing. So the concomitant agent I'll discuss briefly, typically and usually has always been the thiopurine, such as azathioprine or 6 captopurine We've used it as a concomitant agent. We've studied it in these trials I just described to you. We're most familiar with it. The limitation is about 30% of our patients do not tolerate the thiopurine for one reason or another. There's also a frequent lab monitoring that's required. There's a risk of bone marrow suppression, transaminitis, and then other side effects, both acute, whether it's the nausea, flu-like symptoms, or even pancreatitis with an allergic acute reaction, to the long-term. And the long-term ones is what usually scares all of us. Of course, the immune suppression or the infection risk, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, a very rare type of lymphoma called hepatosplenic T-cell lymphoma, which we've seen primarily reported, a very rare type of lymphoma, and primarily reported in young males. What I mean by young is most of the data was age 27 and lower. And then the non-melanomatous skin cancers as well has been associated with bioperience. So in place of that, there's been recent interest in the use of methotrexate in combination therapy, primarily, mostly, initially, for those who are intolerant to thiopurines, but potentially a role, again, in perhaps our young males, where we are worried about the concern with our thiopurines. It has different formulations, both oral and subcutaneous. Limitations, just similar to our thiopurines, it's not really used much as monotherapy, meaning the single agent. There's also a national shortage, sometimes, in the parental route. As far as side effects, short-term, again, and the, uh, the long-term effects, they're rare, but still potential effects, especially hepatic fibrosis. Teratogenic, I see a lot of pregnant IBD patients or, or young women who want to get pregnant, and methotrexate is a teratogenic, so I avoid the use of methotrexate in my young females. But again, I consider it in my young males as combination therapy in place of azathioprine. So our study was able to evaluate the role of combination therapy, and we actually have one of our study partners right here in the room who evaluated this with us, and this study was able to demonstrate that basically whether it's azathioprine or methotrexate in combination, there was, in combination use with the biologic, there was no increased hazard or risk with using one or the other. And they both had a similar risk for, uh, for infections, side effects, and lab abnormalities, specifically the LFTs, which we may see in either methotrexate or azathioprine. <laughs> so the REACT trial. I introduced this study that was recently published to basically demonstrate 
again, whether early combination therapy compared to our conventional, perhaps, step-up therapy, comparing those two and seeing which one works better. And more specifically and importantly, is there a treatment strategy that actually changes outcomes? And so this is trial, it was a randomized trial, and you can see here there was only actually a modest difference initially in the first two years of disease in clinical remission using combination therapy or more of this conventional potentially step-up approach. But what we did see a difference, and again, emphasizing that our therapies have changed the natural progression of the disease, is that for the combination therapy, there was less risk for need of surgery, adverse events or serious complications, as well as hospitalizations. So again, combination therapy, early appropriate therapy for some of our patients might be the best approach. And it's been demonstrated that it can actually affect the natural course history of the disease. So again, our rheumatology colleagues did a better job showing this early on with their data. But it's also because our rheumatology colleagues have it a little bit easier, I'd like to say, because both they see the disease and the patient sees the disease. You see it every day. You look at it. The hands are sore. They're swollen. And if, when the disease advances and progresses more, what happens? The deformities occur. So both provider and patient acknowledge that the disease is happening. They were able to demonstrate that an anti-TNF in this study, infliximab, in combination with methotrexate in this study, was better than placebo and actually affected the natural course history of this disease because there was less joint damage over time among patients who were treated with appropriate combination therapy. We actually have similar data. We were able to see and evaluate if early on, if we treat our patients early on, so from the time of initial diagnosis, less than one to two years, do we affect response and remission to treatment? And sertilizumab was another anti-TNF agent, and it evaluated this. And certainly you can see here that the longer it took us to start our patients on appropriate therapy, the less likely it was for them to respond, perhaps because the inflammation is no longer active inflammation, but more fibrostenotic disease. If we were to scope them every day, which I don't think anyone would let us do, what we would see is that over time, there is improvement, in fact. So that left picture, inflammation, ulceration, edema, the right picture, normal colon. But this is why I say our rheumatology colleagues may have it easier because they see it, the patient sees it, and everyone agrees, this is bad, this may get to this. Everyone sees it, everyone acknowledges it. With intestinal disease, it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to potentially discuss these therapies with our patients who may fear the potential side effects, not understanding that this can happen in the gut. But we know it happens. So this was a huge tri trial to basically demonstrate the natural course. Over a 20-year time period, as you can see, initially most patients initially present with inflammatory disease. But what happens over time is that the disease now progresses to penetrating fistulizing disease as well as stricturing disease. And it's the fibrostenotic, penetrating stricturing disease that is not treatable with our therapies because there's no active inflammation. This is scarred down tissue. And what does that mean? Over time, the risk and need for surgery increases. The same goes for ulcer flies. There's a proportion of patients who, if they have ongoing active inflammation, their risk or need for a colectomy also increases. But what were we able to demonstrate? Well, this study was able to show that since the introduction of anti-TNF therapies, biologics, since 1998, the total trend was downward for the need of colectomy in ulcerative colitis. Again, suggesting, have we impacted the natural history of the disease? So I don't necessarily want us to think top down, step up. That's not how we approach inflammatory bowel disease anymore. I want us to really look at it in this, on this level. Of course we want to improve symptoms. We want to achieve clinical remission and steroid-free remission, but over time, our goals should be mucosal healing 
and histologic remission ultimately because if this side, these two right here, mucosal healing and histologic remission, that impact the natural progression of the disease course. So back to our patient. He was given steroids initially, mesalamine products with topical and oral. And since diagnosis, he's required two or three courses of prednisone each year for flare in his symptoms. Makes us question whether his disease was actually well managed to begin with. Now, four years later, he's hospitalized diarrhea fevers. And as you can see here, he has high inflammatory markers. He has a significant active disease. We treated him with initiation of infliximab and azathioprine while in-house as an inpatient. He had a good response. He was able to be discharged home. But then he gets readmitted. And he gets readmitted again with active symptoms. This is a few weeks later after receiving infliximab. So do we call him what we say a primary non-responder? Do we say that he's not going to respond to infliximab? And if so, do we take out the colon, right? It's ulcerative colitis, let's take out the colon. But what if it's Crohn's disease? Is there potential harm in taking out the colon? Is there potential risk if you do what's called a J-pouch? Is there potential risk for J-pouch failure and complications of the J-pouch in a Crohn's patient? Absolutely. And differentiating between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease can actually be quite difficult. There's a lot of overlap. Nothing is specific. Our clinical instruments or questionnaires, whether we use the Crohn's disease activity index, HBI, Harvey Bradshaw index, these are all very subjective. And our endoscopic findings don't typically correlate with our serum inflammatory markers, the CRP, for example. Endoscopy can't predict or evaluate transmural disease. And as mentioned, pathology is nonspecific. So is there a potential role in using additional serologic markers and data or an assay for this? And the answer is yes. More recently, we've identified additional serologic markers in addition to ASCA and PANCO, which have previously been identified, that have helped us be, uh, use these markers as additional objective measures to understand the disease behavior whether it's small bowel disease involvement, virus stenosis, perforating disease, surgery, pouchitis, et cetera. And the more markers a patient has, the higher risk they were for having a more aggressive disease behavior phenotype, as well as a higher risk for need of surgery. So I checked the serologic markers in our patient, and he actually had high levels of CBER and FLAX which are serologic markers, as you recall, associated with small bowel disease involvement. So I said, well, what does this mean? Let's get an interrography. The prior study was a CAT scan. And on interrography, there actually was hyperenhancement and inflammation in the small intestines. Thank goodness we didn't do a total colectomy. So now we have a patient initially diagnosed with ulcerative colitis, who's now with Crohn's, enterocolitis, and on combination therapy, maybe not doing so well. Well, we know that there are certain factors that increase the clearance of the therapy or affect the pharmacokinetics. We know combination therapy decreases the risk for the drug loss or clearance of it and improves outcomes. And we also know albumin, high CRP, male gender, body size, all of this impacts the pharmacokinetics of our anti-TNF therapies. So we've entered an era, a unique era, to be able to monitor just that. We know that having a good drug level is associated with better response. We know that higher drug concentrations of our biologic therapies is associated with lower inflammatory markers, and also high detectable antibodies is associated with higher CRP. So we were able to check drug levels and antibody levels. In our patient, we were able to do that and we actually found that he had dr low drug levels for obvious reasons, high inflammatory, uh, inflammatory markers of CRP, low albumin, male gender. And so what, what did we do? We increased the dose of his infliximab, and he did well. Nine years later, he has this disease. At some point, we had to change him to methotrexate. He presents with worsening symptoms again. His CRP was slightly elevated this time. But a colonoscopy demonstrated my inability to get through the ileocecal valve to the terminal ileum. And my interrography shows a stricture. Now, in the past, we've usually just sent these patients directly to surgery. 
And in fact, it represents, a, a stricture represents about a fifth of the surgical indications for Crohn's disease. But now we're actually finding that potentially we're able to deal with this endoscopically. So this was his stricture. We dilated it through the scope balloon dilation. We've opened up the lumen, as you can see, and he did well. We've studied the, the impact of our endoscopic dilations here at our institution, and our outcomes have actually been very good and successful. Potentially because one of the primary things we focused on was that before we dilated the area of inflammation, we controlled the disease. But are we entering an era now where there's no longer our ability to use anti-TNF for all of our patients? What do I mean by that? Potentially some patients have lost their response or potentially they are truly primary non-responders to our therapy. Or potentially there's some of these side effects as listed that's affecting our ability to give an anti-TNF agent. So in the drug pipeline, there's a number of new therapies that are coming or have just recently arrived for the treatment and management of inflammatory bowel disease. And we could target these at any area. Lymphocyte trafficking, the accumulation of white blood cells to the gut, gut-specific white blood cells, is a hallmark of inflammatory bowel disease. And potentially, we could even impact it on this level. Again, target-specific therapy. So I'm going to show you a little bit of an animation here. You have your mucosa, your submucosa, and your blood vessel. You have your dendritic cells. Then you have your T cell, macrophages, and white blood cells on the bottom. What happens? Bear with me as the animation happens. There's your antigen. It gets identified by your dendritic cell. It triggers your immune response, as we described and talked about. What happens, your T cells get to the area. T cells get activated. There's a, re a release of inf inflammatory cytokines and proteins, interleukins, in order to try to attack the infection. Your macrophages are put to work. Your effectors T cells are put to work. What happens is, again, there's this huge surge of interleukins and cytokines. The white blood cell says, I have to get to the gut to deal with it, either gut these gut-specific white blood cells. Now, the, the white uh, blood cells enter the gut through that cascade, adhesion cascade. And again, they're gut-specific. They have rece receptors in certain areas. So once they get through, what happens? Wait for it, wait for it. You get inflammation. A friend of mine let me borrow this slide of his, all of these slides to come. So we were able to do that with some of the newer therapies, vetalizumab gut specific white blood cells can try to enter the site. But what happens if we have a protective layer, an anti-integrin coating on our white blood cells? What happens now? Well, now it cannot enter. So that's the thought of how vetalizumab works. Vetalizumab, or in TVO, is given as an infusion and approved for Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. What about interleukin-1223? What if we block the recognition early on here? What happens? Well, recently and hopefully soon we'll get it approved for Crohn's disease and trials for Stellara or Ustekinumab are in, in the works for, for inflammatory bowel disease and currently already used in psoriasis. Just a few more slides here. What about if we block the Jack Kinus cas uh, cascade on a cellular level if we impact inflammation? Well, if we block this, then we are able to potentially modulate the immune system on that level. Our JAK kinase was among one of our first biologic therapies as an oral agent. Our prior therapies have either been subcutaneous or infusion. And recently, there's the Mongerson, another oral biologic therapy with the thought that if we affect SMAD7, which currently creates a large amount of this inflammation, can we impact disease? Typically, again, SMAD7, in the presence of it, our TGF beta-1 signaling is blocked, and there's this release of interleukins and inflammatory markers. What happens if Mongerson comes about? Mongerson is an anti-SMAD7. Well, we block the cascade, and now we have a decrease in the release or the ability for these interleukins. It's oral and gut-specific, exciting, potentially, where we can inhibit the pro-inflammatory cells. And lastly, what about fecal transplant? The idea that we insert healthy stool in a dysbiotic, unhealthy patient. 
The problem is we don't know what's healthy and we don't know what's unhealthy. So we need more research. But the problem, again, is even though we don't know all the research, our patients want it. And they're doing it at home on their own sometimes. So we need to study it. But, and it has been studied. The top study was in Canada, which actually found that weekly enemas with a healthy donor compared to placebo, they actually did better. For six weeks studied, 25, 24% compared to 5% placebo as far as a response. Lower study was in the Netherlands. And these patients, about 50 patients were studied. And these patients had a nasogastric tube inserted. The, do, the, the transplant was administered. And three weeks later, again, nasogastric tube inserted, transplant administered, or a placebo. And compared to placebo, no difference. Was it because our endpoints in these studies were different? Was it because the administration was different? The jury's still out, so we don't quite know. But more research is certainly needed. So personalized medicine, are we there? Can we say you have this mutation, you have this bacteria, this is your clinical phenotype, and this is the treatment? Not yet. We're not there just yet. But we need to get there. And we are getting there slowly. And we're looking at our treatment strategies very differently now more than ever with the hope that we could identify the serotype, the genotype, the phenotype, and with the hope that we can identify who will progress with their disease, and finally make it patient-specific, personalized medicine for the disease. And with that, I thank you for your time.